me Dr. Oravia. Dr. Oravia is an assistant professor at Marshall College, Georgia. He also is part of our ultrasound faculty as well. So we'll hear some more about orthopedics right now. Okay, guys, I'm going to try to wrap this up and keep it in 30 minutes. Uh, they saved uh, not the best for last, so we'll uh, go ahead and jump in here. Uh, I have nothing to, uh, <coughs> to disclose, no conflicts of interest. Uh, we're going to go over some goals and objectives. You can see them there, talk about some uh, different mechanisms, uh, different uh, techniques, and then post-care follow-up. So if nothing else, a picture is worth a thousand words, a video is priceless. So the good news is y'all don't get to hear a whole lot of me. You get to watch video on uh, some of the reduction techniques. So subluxation versus dislocation. Let's talk about that first. Subluxation, simply put, is a partial loss of the congruity between the joint uh, surface and the bone that uh, it articulates with. Dislocation is a complete loss. We want to give it a name. Open versus closed, we're talking more about fractures. Uh, if we're talking about um, dislocations, we're talking about naming it uh, proximal and the distal segment. You always name the angulation uh, based on the proximal segment that, that's uh, dislocated. So just, just go into it knowing that. Re uh, reduction versus relocation, potato, potato. Uh, reduction is the technically correct term, but if you say relocation, nobody's going to, you know, uh, throw you down over that. So what's in your toolbox? That's what this boils down to, right? If you have one technique uh, to reduce the shoulder, then you have a hammer and everything else is a nail. So what I want to, uh, you guys to uh, take home from this today is to uh, have multiple tools in your toolbox to try to reduce uh, whatever it is that you need to reduce. So get into the history and exam. How did it happen? What does it look like? That's going to tell you a lot. Um, based on the uh, patient's presentation. How are they holding it? Are they holding it kind of internal rotation uh, with a little bit of uh, uh, abduction? You know, you're looking at kind of an anterior shoulder. Uh, as a general rule, we're going to try to recreate the injury and make a shoulder look like a shoulder or make a finger look like a finger or an elbow look like an elbow. At the end of the day, that's what you want to do. So sedation. Um, there's, you know, different ways to do this. You can either do some sedation you can do, uh, Rich is a proponent, especially of shoulders, doing uh, joint injections. I am too. Uh, it takes that two provider thing away, right, where you have to have the, the guy doing the sedation and the other person doing the uh, actual technique. So different ways to accomplish our goal. So we're going to get right into this. Uh, so most of the stuff we're going to talk about is extremity and um, uh, ortho things. First one is a TMJ dislocation. So typically what happens is the, uh, the mandibular condyle basically slips out of the condylar groove. Uh, and it's just the way that the TMJ is, is uh, the anatomy of it. The posterior part of the TMJ has a very deep socket and the, the anterior portion of the condyle is very shallow. So that's why it's most times an uh, anterior dislocation. It usually happens with yawning, laughing, singing. I've heard people tell me they took a big bite out of a Big Mac or a hamburger and they came in. So um, this slide is basically just talking about what you have. You have the, the temporalis and the masseter muscles, which are very powerful muscles uh, because they have short distances that they, they span. So what happens is you get a spasm in these muscles after the uh, condyle slips out of the, the groove here, and then they spasm down, and you wind up with a, a, a jaw that's, that's locked open. Uh, usually what's going to happen is the depression defect is going to be on the, the side of the, that's affected, the TMJ there. So you, basically you've lost the condyle out of the groove, so now you're going to feel this defect here. How do we reduce it? Different ways to do it. Classic uh, Tintinale Rosen, you see what's in there, is to uh, downward pressure and back. Okay, so you can do this either facing the patient, and what you want to do is put your thumbs right back in the back of the jaw, behind the uh, last set of molars into that condylar groove, press down and back. Um, one problem with this that I run into is patients tend to kind of run away from you. You're pushing down and back and there's nothing back there for them. You can lean the head of the stretcher up to try to keep them from doing that. Another thing you can do is put them um, recumbent. So they really can't go anywhere. If you're doing sedation with this, that's a good thing too. You're already gonna have them supine. The technique is the same, except you're going to be kind of at the head of the bed. So you're going to be, you know, uh, above them, but the, the rest of it is the same. You're going to put your fingers back on the back set of the molars. You're going to push that 
down and backward pressure. Uh, getting into some uh, less forceful techniques, there's a wrist pivot method uh, you can see here where you kind of kind of use your, your index fingers and you're going to grasp kind of submental with the thumbs. And it's basically kind of a rocking motion where you're using one TMJ as a fulcrum. So you're going to kind of rock down with the other while you're trying to push back with the affected side. Um, a technique that um, I learned about, I don't know, probably a couple of years ago is the, uh, the gromus or the masseter massage. Basically, uh, I'm going to show you this video, but it's a very, uh, there's not very much force at all. It has to do with a lot of man, uh, manipulation of the masseter muscle. So basically, you're going to have one person massaging the muscles, uh, releasing tension on the muscles, while you're applying just a little bit of kind of a casting motion to kind of get that joint down. So he's talking, but I muted all this um, just so you wouldn't have to listen. Um, but basically, he's got thumbs in the mouth. Same technique, you're at the back of the, the molars. And instead of doing what he's showing, you're not doing that, you're doing kind of a... a, a uh, casting motion, so like that. While the other, while you have your assistant kind of massaging the masseter muscles. So here's some actual, you know, patients that he's got. He's going to show for us. We've got some massage going on. This is fast forwarded a little bit. So, but a little massage technique here to the masseter muscles while he's got his thumbs inserted. And you'll see in a minute, that's it. He's using uh, no anesthesia, no sedation, no anything with this. This is all just simple manipulation of the masseter muscles. This is really nice because as soon as you get done with them, you can discharge them home. There's no wait for sedation to wear off or anything. Uh, shoulder dislocations. Um, shoulder dislocation, most commonly dislocated uh, joint that we see. Uh, you probably barely go through a week without seeing at least one or two of these. Uh, the reason it's commonly dislocated is because it's a very shallow joint. It's a very mobile joint, um, and the, the powerful shoulder girdle muscles kind of overtake uh, the ligaments that, that hold the shoulder in place. Anterior dislocation is going to be our, our key dislocation, and 90% of those are going to be subcoracoid and some glenoid uh, dislocations. We're going to talk about posterior dislocations and... Uh, the inferior dislocation in a minute. So how does the patient look when they come in you know, to the ER? Well, they're held in abduction, extension with a little external rotation. The shoulder is affected here. It, you know, it's, it's squared off. It doesn't look like the other shoulder. And they may be leaning a little bit to the other way. Well, you know, first of all, you know, do your physical exam. Uh, you want to check for neurovascular status. Uh, to do this, uh, the easy way to do it is to check the deltoid for motor. Uh, it's a little better to check motor than sensory because there's a lot of overlap in this area uh, with the musculocutaneous nerve and such. You want to get some plain films um, to evaluate uh, anterior versus posterior. Uh, Eric was talking a while ago, one view is no view, so if you can get like a, a four-view shoulder, especially with a, a scapular and an axillary view, that's what you want to get. Uh, and then we'll talk uh, about heel sacs and, and bank arts. So heel sacs and bank art. Well, everybody has a little different opinion on this. Um, they matter long term. Do they matter acutely? The only real reason they matter acutely is if you're having trouble reducing the shoulder. What can happen is you can get a piece of that bone or a piece of that cartilage inhibiting your reduction. But as far as, as acutely, we're not too worried about them. But... Hills, heel sacs basically is on the humerus. What happens is the humerus slips out anteriorly and, and kind of bangs up against the inferior part of the, uh, the labrum, and you get this divot in the soft cartilage of the humeral head. Um, over time, you keep uh, dislocating your shoulder. You know, this tends to bigger divots, uh, more likely to, to um, dislocate that shoulder. The bank heart lesion, on the other hand, is in the glenoid fossa on the anti uh, inferior part of the labrum. And the reason this occurs is because you've already got the, the humerus that's banging up against it. So after a while, you get a defect in the uh, inferior uh, glenohumeral ligament. These are the, reason, are the reason people continue to get repeated dislocations, is because they lose instability in that shoulder girdle. 
in those, you've got the, you've got the, you know, the subscapularis, the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres holding the shoulder externally, but you've got all the superior, medial, and inferior glenohumeral ligaments that hold the, the joint tightly together. So when you um, repeatedly dislocate that, you get a little laxity in it. So we're going to get into the, what y'all really want to know is how do we take care of these, right? A lot of different maneuvers. Um, Stimson maneuver, I don't know, anybody's favorite? You don't have to raise your hand. Um, I typically don't like this too much. Uh, Eric, on the other hand, does like it. But basically, you're going to put the patient prone. You're going to put um, 5 to 10 pounds of weight uh, on the uh, elbow or on the forearm if you have a device to do it. And you're going to um, just let it hang. You can give them a little bit of uh, pain control if you want to. Usually it takes a little while to do this, but the good thing is, is you can step away, let your nurse stay in there, and go do some other things. So this is a little video showing this. Basically, um, this is a video of uh, what we have a couple of residents in our shop kind of demonstrating this. So we've got a device, and basically it's a device that we have that we can wrap around the forearm. You're going to see some uh, attachment points down here for the weight. You're going to have to put the bed up to uh, kind of ortho height, so to speak, and uh, let the weight hang. You need a little bit of, you know, obviously a little bit of clearance there on the ground. But over time, what happens is you just, you, you um, basically beat the, beat the shoulder ligament or the shoulder muscle joint or muscles. And after a while, they give out. Now, what he's doing is he's adding a little scapular manipulation to this technique. And what you want to do with that is you want to kind of take the shoulder, the scapula, and take the inferior part and rotate kind of medially while you take the acromium and kind of rotate out laterally. So you can use the Stimson with the um, uh, shoulder uh, scapula manipulation to help you out. Advantages, um, no assistance is required. Uh, it's minimal force. It's mostly ba based on letting the patient sit there. It's a pretty good success rate, about 96%. Uh, disadvantages, uh, patients up high, you don't want them to slip off the stretcher. You do need kind of equipment, so to speak, to do this, um, and there is time required for the traction. So scapular manipulation is, can be either done prone or seated. Um, you're going to have to have uh, an assistant help you. If it's done seated, basically you're going to have a, an assistant standing in front of the patient uh, with their hand in the girdle with a little traction on the affected arm while you're behind them doing the manipulation where you take the inferior part of the scapula, rotate medially, and the acromion part and rotate out. What that does is that lets the glenoid slip kind of um, a little bit laterally while the, the, patient, the person in front is pushing the humerus um, back into the glenoid fossa. So you can see what we're talking about here. There's your assistant here. They're going to little traction out little push back in the girdle while you're kind of rotating the inferior part of the scapula medially and the superior part of the acromial part up here kind of laterally. Another video. So they're doing this prone. <clears throat> so he's, this, he's going to apply a little downward traction while the operator, you're going to be up here, find the inferior portion of the scapula put your thumb on it, you can put your thumb on the kind of superior lateral part, and then he's going to basically just kind of rotate counterclockwise on the left. You do the opposite on the right. So advantage of this, pretty, tolerated pretty well. Minimal force again, uh, you can do with or without premedication. Pretty high success rate, uh, anywhere between 87 to uh, 97 percent. Disadvantages, sometimes the scapular border is hard to find, especially in those uh, obese patients. You may need a little assistance uh, from someone else, and sometimes that's hard to find in a busy ED. External rotation, um, this is my favorite, uh, this and the Cunningham. Uh, this is a, also known as the Coker method. No equipment, patient supine. Um, <clears throat> you're going to start, and uh, they're going to have it kind of already held in a little bit of kind of abduction. What you're going to do is kind of reassure them while you're kind of um, grasping the forearm, get them in a little adduction and then gently just externally rotate the arm. So what you want to do is make sure you have a good point right here. Hold that elbow very tight. You're going to hold them out distally and basically just slowly rotate. External rotate out. 
If they feel any pain or you feel them kind of, you know, clenching up, just stop what you're doing. You can massage the bicep. It'll kind of help um, relax them a little bit. And then once you come out to external rotation, you go back in. Um, if you don't feel the clunk or feel the, uh, that you've, you know, got your reduction, you can also add, uh, we'll get into it in a minute, you can come out to external rotation and add a milch uh, maneuver to the end of this if you felt like you didn't um, get your reduction. It's usually tolerated fairly well. Uh, it's a single operator. You can or cannot premedicate, depending on what you want to do. Uh, there's really minimal force evolved again. And that's what all these things are about. Back, back, way back when, it was all about let's, let's um, brute force to, to reduce you know, joints. Now it's more about manipulation and trying to, to let the shoulder, let the body kind of put itself back into uh, where it needs to be. Disadvantages, um, there were some previously documented kind of lower rates of method, uh, lower rates, but uh, they look back and uh, they've got some higher rates than what they initially expected or suspected. So the Milch technique is uh, supine. You're going to start with the patient, um, a little bit of um, abduction there. And basically, you're going to take the arm. You're going to externally rotate while you're continual to abduction of the shoulder. You want to get them into kind of extreme abduction. You're going to go all the way overhead, and you're going to add a little external rotation at the end. If you need a little bit of help with this, you can take and um, kind of push down on the humeral uh, head, try to put it back into the glenoid fossa. So like I say, you can use a lot of these techniques together if you uh, don't get the, the results you feel like you needed or that you achieved before. So advantages, tolerated pretty well, single operator again, pretty good success rates, no real downsides to this. The spazo technique, uh, supine, uh, you're going to grasp the arm. Uh, the problem, or one problem with this technique is trying to get them out into that extension without them uh, further spasming on you. So you're basically going to gently, gently kind of lift the arm up. Like I say, that's the hardest part of this to do. A little traction on it. You're going to externally rotate them out like he's doing here. Keep put traction on. If you need, you can put a little downward force uh, into the shoulder girdle, into the coracoid process there. Everybody's favorite, traction, counter traction. Um, when I was a resident, I lived for this. I don't live so much for it now. I'd much rather do, uh, do the other techniques. This is one pretty, everywhere I was pretty well familiar with, right? Um, you got two operators, bed sheet around one for the counter traction. You're on the affected side with a sheet around, or just um, you've grabbed the, uh, the forearm, mid forearm, proximal um, forearm, or, shoulder, or elbow there. Basically, what's going to happen is it's not a, it's not a, you're not wrenching on this, it's just a gentle pull that um, you both are doing in, uh, in a concerted effort. So, as you get your assistant to lean back, you're leaning back too. Just keep leaning back, keep pulling gentle traction. After a while, you'll overcome the shoulder girdle muscles, and uh, it should pop back in. So they're going to demonstrate that for us. One key thing is to get the get the sheet up in the in the uh, axilla. A lot of times, it'll be too far down, and you're not putting your fulcrum uh, up here in the axilla where you need it. It's down here in the kind of mid ribs. Another thing, and um, they could have probably put the bed up a little higher. You want to get every, everything in plane so you're not pulling uh, opposite forces. Uh, advantages, everybody's pretty familiar with it, uh, high success rate. Now this does come into play for those shoulders that have been out for hours uh, maybe or somebody who's very muscular and has a lot of uh, shoulder strength, so to say, to overcome. Disadvantages, you're probably going to have to have some procedural sedation with this more than one operator, and it takes a, a fair amount of force. Cunningham technique, um, this has become my favorite or maybe second favorite, uh, that and the Coker method. Uh, it's very little force, it's a lot of uh, massage, uh, loosen up the, uh, the biceps and the uh, glenoid um, humeral ligaments. 
Basically, what you're going to do is you're going to um, get kind of eye to eye with the patient, same level with the patient. You're going to um, put your shoulder, I mean, your hand right in the AC fossa, and you're going to have them grasp your shoulder. The good thing about this technique, technique is you're not far from their, their zero position that they're in. All they have to do is kind of pull their elbow kind of up, and they'll usually do that um, pretty readily for you. Ask the patient to kind of sit up straight, sh uh, shrug the shoulders, and what this does is when they shrug the shoulders, it kind of tilts that glenoid fossa uh, forward a little bit. So you can see he's kind of eye to eye or shoulder to shoulder with the patient. Just gently, you know, put their hand on your shoulder, put your hand right in the AC fossa. And then you want to start massaging and you start kind of at the deltoid and just move down. Now I'd avoid, you know, right at the proximal humerus, but you can massage the deltoid, massage the bicep, the long head of the bicep right there, and then just go down the arm. This technique takes about uh, anywhere between two to five minutes to do, so it's not going to be 30 seconds. So if you haven't done it in 30 seconds, don't, don't think it's not going to work. And you can see he's kind of massaging down. And in a minute, you'll see the shoulder kind of go from squared off to normal. Once again, he's using no sedation. Um, you could probably uh, do a shoulder injection if you wanted to to kind of facilitate this. But just keep on with that gentle, that gentle massage. And once again, he's pulling down traction in the fossa, and the patient's here with a hand on the shoulder. And you're going to see it go in just a second. That's it. Um, another technique that I came across about six months or so ago was the, uh, the boss, I can't say that, Holzak matter technique. This is something you can actually teach your patients to do at home. Uh, the first time you do it, you probably need to do it with them while they're in the ER, but basically it's an auto-reduction technique. So you're going to have them sitting in the stretcher, grasp the, the knee, the, the ipsilateral knee, and if the head of the bed is up, basically you're going to drop the head of the bed and just let them lay back. You want them to kind of extend their neck and shrug their shoulders forward. What, all, what this does is this anteriorly rotates or antiverts the glenoid fossa again and, and pushes the humeral head backwards as they're kind of applying their own traction, counter traction. So it's a pretty good technique. Once again, it's something you can show them and they can probably do at home. Maybe save them a five hour wait in the ER. Posterior dislocations, um, this is board type stuff or maybe research stuff. It's usually a seizure and electrocution. Um, the arm is, is held in adduction and internally rotated, opposite from an anterior. Um, you're going to have reverse heel sacs fractures uh, on the anterior medial portion of the uh, humerus instead of the an, uh, posterior lateral part. The big thing is, is this can be missed in about 50% of uh, x-rays, and this is you know, one of these litigation things. And it's missed in 50% of the x-rays because a lot of times it's AP films or PA films that you're getting. So you want, that's why you want to try to get that axillary or that scapula uh, view. Um, it's the same technique, it's a counter, uh, traction, counter traction for the posterior dislocation it works pretty well. So what I want to try to get you here is to, uh, some signs to, uh, to look for posterior shoulder dislocation. Normal shoulder here, all right, uh, humeral head right in the fossa. Uh, one sign is the light bulb sign. Okay, what happens is it's the humeral head internally rotates. So now that you're able to see the kind of humeral heads uh, face on, so to speak. So you get this, it, it appears kind of like a light bulb. That's one sign. You can see it there. Another sign is the rim sign. So what happens is you've got the humeral head, once again, kind of face on again. And what happens is as it, as it internally rotates, it, it pulls away from the glenoid fossa. So you have this, this gap. Uh, more than six millimeters is considered that, that rim sign. So you can kind of start, start suspecting uh, posterior dislocation. 
The uh, vacant glenoid sign is when the uh, humeral head is, is essentially out. Um, that's pretty easy to tell. Trough sign, a little more subtle, but what happens is you get the impaction uh, as the humeral head internally rotates forward. So you ha basically have two overlying structures causing, uh, you basically have the humeral head kind of overlying the glenoid fossa and you can see the trough, right, or this radiolucency uh, between the two, between actually the posterior part of the glenoid fossa and the humeral head there. Inferior shoulder dislocations, pretty rare, but when you see them, you know that's what it is. They come in kind of with the hand on the back of the head. Uh, the reduction technique is going to be a traction, counter-traction technique. That's about it. You want to try, apply that axial traction, which they already are, a little bit of hyper-abduction, and then somebody else pulling counter-traction. Post-reduction care, uh, once you get these things splinted, uh, I mean splinted, reduced, uh, you want to put them in some sort of immobilization. We typically uh, immobilize them with a sling or an immobilizer if you have one at your shop in an internal rotation. There is some literature out there to suggest that for the first time shoulder dislocations, external rotation may be a better way to decrease uh, recurrences down the road, but for now I just put them in internal ro uh, that internal rotation. Uh, for younger patients, uh, they may need early, early surgery, surgical follow-up. Uh, for the people older than 40 um, or 50, uh, you want to do some exercises at home, increase early range of motion so that they don't get that frozen shoulder. Elbow dislocation. So we spend a lot, a lot of time on shoulders because that's the, kind of the biggest ones we see, but the elbow dislocations are kind of second most common. Simple. They're going to be posterior or anterior. Uh, most of them are going to be posterior dislocations. Uh, usually is a foosh with the elbow kind of in extension and it pushes that, the, the uh, radius and the ulnar kind of posteriorly to the um, distal humerus. They're going to present um, with uh, that olecranon very prominent. So the prone or sitting technique is kind of um, a usual go-to or the supine. But basically you want to get the elbow right at the edge of the bed. You can either have an assistant or you can do the whole thing yourself, but you're going to push the olecranon. You're going to take the olecranon push out while you're putting a little gentle uh, traction down. This is the same thing here. You just have a, a, uh, an assistant with you. So a little forward track or a little forward push with a downward traction there on the, on the prone or the sitting technique. The supine technique, you're going to have somebody, basically it's the same forces, it's just a different direction. You're going to have somebody applying the, the downward pressure here while you gentle traction or gentle pull out here with some gentle traction. If you don't get what you, the desired effect, what you can do is while you're doing a little gentle traction uh, with the forearm in this direction, you can pull a little bit out at the proximal, uh, elbow, or proximal forearm there. Pretty high success rate. Um, you will definitely feel or, or hear the clunk. Uh, a, another technique that um, is accepted and, and done pretty easily is an interlocking hand technique. You basically take your, your fingers, interlock the hands, and you're going to use your elbow in their AC fossa as your fulcrum. And then what you're going to do is just flex that elbow back and you, you, can't, you can't hear. I'll turn the audio off, but you could actually hear the clunk on this. Um, and that's it. Done. Post-reduction care for these guys, you're going to want to put them um, in a uh, posterior splint. You want to make sure that you, this is a big thing. Uh, Eric talked about it a while ago. Check for median nerve, ulnar nerve function, um, and distal pulses because the brachial artery runs right here too. Uh, the elbow is associated a lot of times with some fractures just because it's an inherently deep joint. So uh, a lot of bony prominence is there. So make sure you get a, a pre and post film with this. A lot of times if you're having trouble reducing an elbow, it's because you've got a, a piece of bone that's um, inhibiting the, um, the reduction. And then early follow-up with ortho. Uh, radial head dis, uh, subluxation, nurse-made elbow, um, pretty easy to, uh, to take care of. You can either do a, a supination flexion because they're gonna, the kid's going to kind of come in uh, with, the, with it held kind of a little bit of pronation, but basically supinate the hand while you uh, flex the elbow. Or you can do a hyperpronation technique where they're already held out here and you just take and take the, just pronate them down. Um, <clears throat> you'll hear, a, or hear and feel the clunk and the kid will usually start um, using the hand after that. 
One good kind of trickery technique that I use is to bring them a popsicle or a lollipop or something like that and make them use that hand. If they're using that hand, success. Hip dislocations, uh, it's one of the few ED uh, ortho emergencies. For native hips, that's the, that's the key. For uh, non-native or uh, um, prosthetic hips, that's not so much um, a problem. Posterior versus anterior, uh, most of these are going to be posterior dislocations. They're going to come in uh, flexed, adducted, and internally rotated, and the leg's going to be shortened. So the Alice technique, the one we're most familiar with, is um, you're going to basically be at the stand on the bed with the patient. You're going to put your forearm kind of right in the popliteal fossa, and you're going to have their ankle kind of right in your uh, groin area. And you're basically, it is a lift up, but it's also a sit back, okay? That gives you that leverage to kind of pull that, um, that femoral head kind of um, back into, uh, into the acetabulum. So this is, uh, I think this was actually a uh, prosthetic hip, so it goes back in fairly easy. But you can see his, where he's got, he pulls up, a little, little lean back, and then you can uh, internally, externally rotate. Make sure you have a spotter for this. <laughs> Last thing you want to do is fall off the bed and, and have to check into the ER. So The couple of other techniques that are a little less, um, I don't know, worrisome about getting on the bed, the Captain Morgan technique is uh, you're basically going to put your uh, foot on the bed and you're going to put your knee in that popliteal fossa and you're going to have um, one hand uh, right in the knee in the fossa there and the other hand kind of distally at the ankle. As you, um, and what you're going to do is you're going to basically kind of plantar flex your foot which pushes up here at the popliteal fossa and then you can add a little bit more uh, upward force with your hand. At the same time, you're pushing downward force on the distal, uh, on the uh, tibia on the ankle. Same thing, it kind of pivots the femoral head back into the acetabulum. Whistler technique, I honestly have had zero success with this. And the reason is, is I, I just don't think you can get enough leverage on this. Um, but if you're the only guy in your shop, if everybody else is out to lunch and, and you're doing this on, <clears throat> by yourself, um, you're basically going to put your hand on the unaffected knee, uh, put the affected um, leg or right here, and then put your uh, hand real distally. The, the more distal you go, the more leverage you're going to have. You're going to um, flex the, the hip at 90 degrees. You're going to pull up here with the proximal hand and push down with the distal hand. Post-reduction aftercare, you want to get the, the films, document your neurovascular status. Um, abduction pillow and limited flexion is key for these because they'll just keep um, uh, dislocating them if you don't. If, if this is a, a native hip, uh, admission is recommended because uh, they're going to you know, not need to be doing a whole lot for probably a day or two. If this is a non-native hip or a, a prosthetic hip, you can reduce these, give them an abduction pillow and let them go. Patella dislocation, uh, pretty commonly seen. Um, it's usually in uh, kids more so than adults. Most of these are lateral uh, dislocations, and the reason that is is because the, the condylar groove, the femoral groove, the medial condyle is, has a very deep angle on it, and the lateral part of the epicondyle has a very shallow angle. So that's why most of these are lateral dislocations. Um, and it's usually a direct blow to the knee. So how do we do this? You can um, have the patient seated or you can have them supine, but what you want to do is you want to flex the hip. Uh, it takes a little bit of tension off some of the quads while you extend the knee and apply a little bit of um, anterior and medial force to that lateral patella edge. If it is a medial dislocation, you just do the opposite. Uh, apply a little uh, anterior but medial, I mean, but lateral force to that uh, patella. Put them in a knee immobilizer um, and they're good to go. That's uh, some references. Any questions on this? I know it's kind of a lot to cram in, but I was trying to get us out sort of on time. All right.